Chaos was a 1985 wizard dueling turn-based strategy game that challenged the type of games a computer could do as well, if not better than on a tabletop. Inspired by a card game British designer Julian Gollop penned years earlier, and Warlock, an early Games Workshop card game, it was one of the great strategy classics of the dawn of the computer gaming age. Julian's desire to revisit his original spell-slinging battle game has never ceased. Its most obvious revival was Chaos Reborn, successfully crowdfunded in 2014. It was a true-to-form remake of the original game, down to the stylized monster designs and spells. But this wasn't the first time Julian sought to remake his fantasy classic. In fact, it wasn't even the second. Five years after making Chaos, Julian and his team at Mythos Games made Lords of Chaos, a more graphical interpretation of his original design, with additional role-playing game elements and story. Yet there was another attempt that seems to have fallen off the pages of gaming history, an underexposed reimagining of Chaos, some 13 years after its original release. Trying new technology, shedding turn-based combat, and making some sweeping changes to the formula, I present to you the fantastic experiment known as Magic and Mayhem. Julian Gollop was an avid tabletop strategy game fan. Making video games as early as high school, and after moving from a small town in Essex to London to learn economics at a university, he spent more time devoted to his game-making passion than to schooling. Julian wrote Chaos the Battle of Wizards for the ZX Spectrum, a UK-centric rival of the Commodore 64. The game was first published by Games Workshop and this title single-handedly set the course of events that would put down Gollop as one of the masters of strategy computer games. Chaos pitted two or more wizards against each other in an empty arena. Each turn began with choosing a spell to cast, either summoning a creature, or damaging, debuffing, or enhancing an existing one, followed by a movement and attack phase. If you're familiar with turn-based combat, you'd probably guess that there are ranged creatures, fast creatures, flying creatures, etc. But the twist here is how straightforward, yet unpredictable, this game was designed to be. Every creature, whether a rat, wizard, or mighty dragon, dies in a single hit. All attacks are a percentage chance to succeed, improved or lowered based on the strength of the attack versus the target's defense. This can lead to incredible moments, where you manage to sneak a weaker creature up to an enemy wizard and miraculously defeat them first try, only to later miss after miss with your massive club-wielding giant. On one hand, taking squares and eliminating enemies without complicated stat sheets is simple and elegant like a game of chess. On the other, it's highly reliant on chance and calculated risk. Nothing is guaranteed in chaos, and its addictive Russian roulette-style combat kept players repeatedly hitting that replay button back in 1985. Playing a game today that is old as myself, I wasn't expecting much of a looker, and it isn't. What it is, though, is a tight strategy game that offers imaginative, randomity-heavy combat with a variety of spells that will keep you guessing. Though Julian Gollop is most known as the creator of the revered XCOM series, the legendary turn-based strategy games that inspired a swath of game classics ranging from Fallout to Diablo. Bringing tactics and strategy to a modern world with gun squads and alien invaders was an instant hit and spawned imitations for decades to come. Microprose's sequel, XCOM Terror from the Deep, sent players to the depths of the ocean, but otherwise changed relatively little of the original gameplay. Julian and his team were rehired for the third entry of the series, XCOM Apocalypse, which made many sweeping changes like higher resolution graphics, optional real-time combat, and many more levels of elevation, the latter two causing strain on the series' formula and tech behind it. After the long and troubled development of Apocalypse, Julian and his crew at Mythos decided to try a new take on his Chaos game concept. Lacking the license to the original title, they set out with a new name, setting, and real-time game mechanics. Magic and Mayhem was picked up by the publisher Virgin Interactive, and the journey through this inspired yet flawed game began.
What makes Magic and Mayhem stand out from Chaos's multiple remakes and iterations is its strong sense of personality. Few titles have the mix of old and new artistry stitched throughout its designs, as this game does. You're immediately treated to a cinematic story introduction of a wizard's apprentice who returns to his master's tower only to find it hastily abandoned. This intro showcases exceptional Ray Harryhausen-esque claymation, like something out of Jason and the Argonauts or Clash of the Titans, likely inspirations. This deliberate art direction made it one of the few games to use claymation models for the game's units. This gives Magic and Mayhem an unmistakable look and feel. The game's world and story is told over three fantasized versions of historic Europe. Albion, with druids wandering through gentle rivers dividing Celtic plains. Ancient Greece, with mythological figures like Jason and the Golden Fleece. And eventually to the conflicts of Merlin, Mordred, and King Arthur in the realm of Avalon. Each have their own architecture, style, and use of musical instruments, with Irish folk inspiration for Albion, stringed instruments for Greece, and more synth and modern music for the medieval world. And the music. Oh, the music. Even from its more negative reviews, critics praised the game's unforgettable soundtrack. Mythos hired the Afro-Celt sound system to imagine the game's unique soundscapes, mixing bagpipes, penny whistles, West African influences, and even electronic accompaniment, it was truly a marvel. Each track was tuned to the three worlds, Albion, Greece, and Avalon, and were executed to such musical precision that I catch myself humming them, even today. The core of the gameplay is combat, with brief dialogue interludes. You begin with a wizard as your starting unit, and should they perish, the game ends. The casting chance mechanic of Chaos has been replaced with a traditional mana bar. You can pick up consumable items and even one-off spells throughout your adventure. But the bulk of the action will be ordering units around, like a real-time strategy game, and casting spells. Each spell has unique characteristics and uses. There are simple attack spells like Fireball, and the more powerful Lightning, summoning creatures is vital, but it's balanced by your unit cap. A dozen elves have the same mana cost as a single griffin, but it would consume much of your unit cap, so what you summon and when comes into play. Mana is both a resource and a balancing act, and managing a posse of creatures is important as your mana does not regenerate. The search for mana sprites to consume and places of power to hold are a must. How you defend and position yourself and your army to guard your mana sources is one of the key strategies to the game. You have a diversity of tactics and effects you can create. Cast Lightning Storm around a thatched village to burn them out of shelter. Grow a tangle vine between you and another wizard to escape their reach. Devour multiple enemies in an ever-growing gooey blob. Craft healing or attack totems to protect your units in places of power. Or just destroy a chunk of the world with the awesome Apocalypse spell. Flammability is so addictive in Magic and Mayhem. Start a brush fire and watch it engulf an army. Call lightning down on a tree and see it spread to a nearby shack, or flush out defenders by burning down their walls and defenses. You can create cheaper illusions of creatures that intelligent units have a chance to disbelieve. Summon magic wings and take yourself or your army to the skies, or perhaps drop a field of magic mist to disrupt and confuse your pursuers. The game featured impressive physics to back up your awesome magic powers. Damaging a rooftop can cause tiles to fall and hit creatures under its protection. Levitating an enemy into the air will eventually drop it from the sky and crush it based on weight and fall distance, and area of effect spells can burst into a sphere rather than simply a flat circle. The game balances spell loadouts and ensures every match is different via the unique portmanteau system. You can assign spell ingredients to either Law, Neutral, or Chaos Talismans, with one of three spell options per ingredient. Choosing between summoning a powerful creature, an enchantment, or a form of healing makes for interesting and challenging loadout building. 
Magic and Mayhem features a sizable campaign with multiple difficulty levels, PvP multiplayer over LAN and the internet, plus an offline bot mode which pits the player against one or more AI wizards. Bots were my mainstay mode, jumping into one of dozens of maps, trying new techniques, spells, and creatures. The cliché idea that no two matches are alike is absolutely true here, with such a wild and powerful arsenal of abilities. And as with many games by Mythos, the AI would recalibrate after each match, and would try to mix up its strategies to outwit your own. It was these sorts of personal touches that made concept before product games so special. It was from an era of inspiration, before game design settled into the comfortable normalcy of standard genres. After playing a demo back in 1999, I was ecstatic to try the final game. But then the delays and confusing localization emerged. First was the unusual decision for Virgin Interactive US to rename the game to Duel the Mage Wars for the States. But when that same company was liquidated after Viacom sold Virgin Interactive proper, the American publishing rights went to Bethesda Softworks, who decided to retain the original title, Magic and Mayhem. Their weak marketing, confusing title changes, and delays likely influenced the underwhelming sales for one of the most interesting strategy games that year. Despite strong competition in the likes of Alpha Centauri, Homeworld, and Age of Empires 2, the translation of the precise turn-based tactics of chaos into a real-time RPG strategy hybrid was a risky move. But I think they rethought the rules and gameplay as well as you could expect, though the game did suffer technologically. Compared to the 3D accelerated Marvel Unreal, released a year prior, Magic and Mayhem's archaic engine buckled at the seams with every move. With gameplay locked at a glacial 10 frames per second, it can feel slow, clunky, and unresponsive. When a large area of effect spell with many physics and terrain interactions occurs, the game stalls while it catches up. The unfortunate drawback of two-dimensional games is that common quality of life features like rotating the camera and easily navigating verticality are problems. Even with a layer toggling button, it's difficult to track units inside of buildings, second floors, or on rooftops. A real shame since it has so many interactions with the Z-axis, hard-coded into the engine. The game itself is pretty stable, and I encountered few bugs and issues. My biggest complaint with the game is at its core, the slow-turning 2D engine that struggles to push out the dismal frame rate and imperfect handling of elevation and building cutaways, issues that would likely require a complete rewrite of the game's engine. To many surprise, UK and US publishers Virgin and Bethesda respectively rolled out a sequel to Magic and Mayhem in 2001, not with a bang, but with a whimper. Mythos Games did not return as developer of the sequel and they cancelled their unofficial XCOM successor and shuttered their doors that same year. Magic and Mayhem The Art of Magic was given to newcomer Charybdis Limited, another UK developer. Regrettably, it's often a painful transition when a project moves from the minds behind an idea to the inheritors of the project. In the case of The Art of Magic, despite receiving slightly more critical praise than the original, it didn't transition as well as it could have. This prequel was set in the same world as the original, though most characters do not make an appearance. In some ways, it's a remake, with many of the same spell concepts and ideas, yet they are noticeably different. Though returning with a charming soundtrack, you'll feel dismayed by its unpolished look and feel. Screens like the portmanteau system seem stitched together and are considerably less intuitive. Much of the user interface seems almost temporary, as if they intended to improve it later. Creature animations were lackluster, and the style and flavor of the original's beautiful claymation fantasy world is gone. In one of the most jarring cases of early 3D sequel syndrome I've ever witnessed, the uninspired art style treats you to bland, blurry textures and blocky trees cut off at the stump. A new engine was built from the ground up, which had an unfixed camera and a smoother frame rate, yet the game mechanics suffered. In spite of a true 3D game world, combat was flatter than ever. Hills and elevations seem cosmetic. You can no longer order flying creatures to levitate in place, and the complex environmental physics interactions are all but gone. Terrain doesn't ignite, buildings don't disintegrate under stress, and even monster battles, though smoother and more responsive, feel like random clusters of conflict, sometimes with little danger or consequence if you outsmart the dull AI. This new iteration failed to implement the same tactical layer of depth purported by the original, but more conspicuously, its heart and soul had faded away.
Magic and Mayhem's two-dimensional rendering engine was already dated at launch, yet its code bordered on simulation. The art of magic brought modern graphics, but limited development stripped the game of its advanced gravity, material flammability, and elevation mechanics. Ironically, in upgrading the graphics technology and using a much more advanced engine, this sequel devolved to a simpler, less innovative game, missing much of its personality and what made the original so addictive. The game's development scars were conspicuous. If giving a complete engine rewrite to a new developer wasn't enough, Charybdis folded mid-development, with much of the staff moving to Climax Nottingham, who completed the project. Portrait art that looked like crude placeholders, an awful and cluttered user interface, missing animations, and weak art direction made this game seem like it was let out to die. In the early 2000s, when the real-time strategy bubble had popped and the genre was on the ropes, Art of Magic, at times, seems like an unenthusiastic cash-in on brand recognition, what there was of it anyway, by the publishers. With Julian Gollop going back to the original turn-based chaos design in the more recent Chaos Reborn, a great strategy game which I enjoy quite a lot, yet it is missing the unique voice and formulaic experimentation that Magic and Mayhem attempted with some success. Magic and Mayhem is a flawed masterpiece, uncomfortably wedged between slow and methodical strategy and firmly in the technological canyon of 2D and 3D games. A remake with a tighter engine, smoother gameplay, and an easier way to view and manipulate a three-dimensional world could be a modern-day classic. It plays a lot like the massively successful multiplayer online battle arena games like League of Legends, but with a lot more fun environmental interaction and minion control. It was rough at times, but its ideas still ring as sound as they did almost 20 whole years ago. Will these ideas be renewed in some form in the future? We can hope. But until then, let's do our best to ensure Magic and Mayhem's brilliance and promise is not forgotten. I hope you enjoyed this page from Gaming History. Likes and subscribes are always appreciated and do help spread this message further. A huge thanks from the bottom of my heart for all the support from my amazing patrons. And as always, thank you for watching.